Hello and welcome to this AIM North America webinar on barcode and RFID technologies, proven tools for operational efficiencies and bottom line management. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping notes I'll be reviewing. First, as you may have noticed, you are muted during this panel discussion. If you are interested in submitting questions to the panel, please send those by utilizing the Q&A option that's located at the bottom of your application screen. We'll get to as many questions as possible. Also, all registered attendees will be notified when a recording of this is available. Now, let me go over the AIM North America Antitrust and Collaboration and Work Product Policies. It's the policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM North America activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. And then AIM North America committee meetings are, and webinars are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM's developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. And before I introduce the panelists, I did want to briefly tell you about AIM North America. AIM North America stands as the forefront trade organization uniting manufacturers, distributors, educators, and users of AIDC technologies like barcode and RFID. Our commitment lies in delivering unbiased, accurate information on AIDC technologies and its applications without commercial influence. And now I'm happy to introduce our panel of experts for today's session. Our moderator is Dwayne Roebuck, who is the Senior Channel Manager of Retail and IoT at Blue Star. Dwayne also holds the role of Chair for the AIM North America Cannabis Work Group. Welcome, Dwayne, and thanks for moderating. Hey, thank you, Michael. I um, appreciate the opportunity. We also have Dave Eagleson, the founder and CEO of Outlaw Technology. Yep, happy to be here. And last but not least, we have Ken, Kevin Gannon, Systems Account Manager for VFI Technology. Thanks for including me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start off uh, by having each of us provide a little bit of uh, a brief overview of uh, our background and our organizations, and then we'll jump right into um, the panel. So for those unaware, um, I've been at uh, Blue Star. We're a distributor of uh, technology equipment. Globally, uh, we're the largest distributor of point of sale equipment, but we also distribute digital signage, um, barcode scanners, RFID technology, and a whole host of other uh, technologies that apply in um, not only in the cannabis industry, but traditional retail, healthcare, government, and uh, manufacturing and TNL. Uh, we work through a reseller channel. Um, so um, you know, at this point, I will have uh, Dave to give us a little bit of background on him and uh, Outlaw Technology, and then uh, we'll have Kevin um, anchor us off, and then we'll jump right into uh, the questions. Uh, appreciate it, Dwayne. Yeah, Dave Eagleson. So I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Outlaw Technology. My background is 24 years doing RFID technologies and barcode related technologies, first with a company called Matrix that was acquired by Symbol. You might know it as Zebra now. Um, I started the uh, Outlaw Company about five years ago. The intent was taking advantage of, uh, and we'll get into this in our discussion, um, RFID tags that are placed on plants and packages via metric. Um, metric is a major player within the cannabis space. And again, we'll touch on that shortly. So the intent of Outlaw is to provide tool sets, handhelds, touchscreens, just complete applications to allow people to stay compliant. So with that, I'll hand it off to Kevin. All right. Yeah, so I'm uh, with BFI Technology and the Systems Account Manager there. Uh, we provide consultation for uh, dispensaries, manufacturing facilities, cultivation facilities with their tech stack and do website development, um, custom development, and uh, provide an e-commerce solution for, um, you know, our clients in the cannabis space specifically, um, utilizing kind of a lot of what we'll be talking about today, but, um, you know, uh, kind of looking at the regulatory piece and, and how we can assist with, uh, you know, how everything kind of fits together. Oh, and, and if I can, I'm going I'm to step back for a brief minute and talk about the Cannabis Work Group, um, which I didn't do. Um, we, we have a uh, work group within uh, AIM uh, where, you know, our members and, uh, you know, um, our respective partners, you know, jump on. And, you know, the intent of this work group is to uh, 
figure out ways of uh, not only reaching out to the cannabis industry, but to also help the individuals within that industry in terms of uh, making sound decisions in terms of product and um, solutions. And so, uh, you know, we, we really want to be a uh, trusted advisor. We can't sell you anything. Um, but what we can do is uh, we can share our knowledge that we have from other verticals, um, you know, in, in my opinion, and those on this panel, I know and from talking to previously, cannabis is just a, a sub, you know, um, vertical within retail. And so a lot of the challenges they have are challenges that what we would call traditional retailers like Nordstrom, Walmart, those type of guys have. And it's just educating, you know, those the individuals within the cannabis industry in terms of the viability of that. So with that being said, we welcome um, if anybody would like to join us um, or sit in on a meeting or, you know, and if you're in the cannabis industry and would like to weigh in, we welcome you with open arms. So thank you. And uh, as, uh, as Mike said earlier, if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to uh, put them in. He's going to take a look at them. And, um, you know, when they're applicable, you know, either at the end or even during this, uh, he can shoot them in and we'll do our best to address them either live or, um, you know, we can get back to you if we don't have enough time. So with all of that being said, let's set the stage a bit here. We know the cannabis industry as I just stated, it's just a retail business with its own set of challenges uh, related to policies and laws that are a bit outdated. I don't think you know anybody in the industry would argue that. Staying away from getting into the depths of it, especially you know politics and things like that, we want to take a look at it from an inventory track and traceability perspective. Um, can can you guys briefly describe some of the unique set of challenges? the individuals within this industry face. And again, let's keep that, you know, let's stay away from hydroponics, lighting and all of that. Let's keep it to uh, <laughs> track and traceability, please. So whichever one of you guys wants to jump in first. Sure. Sure. I'll take it. Um, look, I think that the challenge of, of data collection in this industry is a little bit unique. And I'll tell you the uniqueness. You're correct in that it is retail, right? There's a storefront of some sort in this world. It's called a dispensary. But the reality of it is there's two sets of books. What do I mean by that? You've got to basically keep your own internal reporting, whether it's your ERP, your own systems, but then you also have to have the compliance aspect of it. So you'll hear in this industry a lot seed to sale. So the difference in other markets is a lot of the vendors that exist or licensees, as we refer to them in this industry, are verticalized. They'll have a cultivation facility. They'll have a processing facility slash distribution and dispensary. So back to data collection, um, they have the same challenges, cycle what do I have on the shelf? But then the added ben the added challenge, I would say, is not only are they trying to know for themselves, but they're also having to report to the state they, li they, they reside in, right? If I'm in Missouri or if I'm in Michigan, I've got to tell the state that I've got this in the back stock. I've got this that I sold. Because again, they, they're getting judged by it. That's where it differs from so the Walmarts, the traditional retailers. The traditional retailers have their systems. That doesn't mean they're telling the states they operate in exactly what got sold today. So I don't know if you have anything further on that, Kevin. Sure. Yeah, I, I think I think that the initial compliance piece of it created kind of or facilitated, I think, advancing advancements in the industry that that are yet to be realized. Um, I, I think specifically with cultivation and the manufacturing side, before it even gets to the dispensary side, these metric tags are providing. Um, you know the ability to trace seed projects and and other other you know kind of advancements that that companies are trying to make with their production and their their processes and they're able to track it down to the individual plant. I mean, for example, if you're running a seed project and you are pulling off of ten to twenty mothers, you're able to track all the way back to you know generations where that came from and the ability to do that and have that be that granular and specific in your record keeping built into what you're already providing to the state as opposed to trying to use a composition notebook and keep track of what, where things were coming from. I think it's going to push a lot of these these 
cultivators to to the next level. Um, you know, so I, I think that there's a lot of different ways that this is be- being benefited, but that's one of the ones that I see the most most prominent right now. Yeah, one other thing I'll throw in there, Dwayne, just real quick for context for people. People have to understand that when the state of Colorado started this endeavor, right, they were an island. What I mean by that, they were the only state that were going after this. The federal government was looking very closely at it. And we know what happened. Maybe most of us, some of us, I'm old, right? In California in the 90s, it was a mess, right? So Colorado put this seed to sale. You keep hearing this term seed to sale. The intent is, and we'll refer to a company called Metric, Marijuana Enforcement Tracking Reporting Compliance. So Metric created a statewide system. I call it the DMV of cannabis in order to track these plants all the way through the process. Why is that important? If I'm the state auditor in Colorado, I need to make sure that I can legitimately show the federal government that I'm doing everything possible to cut out the black market, that products not leaving and going to people they shouldn't, that are under 21, all of those kind of things. So I think what people have to understand the context of this industry is very tightly controlled. Um, the layering of the technology, the barcode, the RFID, the ability that I have to tell you this plant became this package, became this product, is very unique. It's very unique. And I think it was born out of the necessity. If this wasn't done very tightly like this, then the industry probably might have imploded. And I mean, once Colorado went, Oregon went, a lot, you know, and it, the dominoes started going. So it set a precedent that said, we're going to track this very, very clear, carefully. And all of the technologies are things, barcode, RFID, all of these technologies are AIDC. So just as context, I thought that might be important. No, no, no. And and speaking of context, you know, uh, I'm a stickler for, you know, trying to make sure that everybody is aware of uh, what we're talking about. So I'm going to throw you a real softball here. I'm talking underhanded, Kevin. Um, Dave, keep referencing uh, seed to sell. Can you, uh, you know, take us through exactly what seed to sell is? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, in the cannabis industry, you're you're starting with your your clone groups, right? And those have their own kind of zone, depending on your state. There are, um, you know, ways that they want them broken up or, or applied to to those, um, you know, to those batches within the seed to sale tracking system. Uh, immediately upon breaking in most states, it's six to eight inches um, where you have to apply a, a, a metric tag, right? Or, or you know, exactly what. what what Dave has right there. Um, once it's basically not going to kill the plant by having the weight <laughs> of that on, on it on its uh, stem. Um, at that point, uh, you know you're going to run through your veg cycles. You're going to get into flowering. The tag stays with it the entire time through all pruning and trellising events, um, all the way to harvest. Um, at harvest, you utilize you know whatever system you're going to use. I have my preference, right? Um, right. You know, uh, there you're, you're going to associate a weight a wet weight for that that harvest and the tag will stick with that plant all the way through the drying and curing process as it sits in uh your 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 dry room Um, from there the the tags are removed and you apply another tag that sits over the top of the entire harvest batch right so it's got one of those there you got your your (laughs) batch tags right um those batch tags sit on top of that uh you know most states have a rules on the size of the harvest batches once you move down into um you know size of product that you can sell to the public uh, you know so for instance in the state that i live in in missouri it's 15 pounds so you you break that harvest down into those those size uh you know units underneath an individual tag uh, from there you go through your state regulatory testing and and you know packaging right once it gets through those processes, you apply another tag and you send that out to the dispensary itself. And then the idea being that the state, as well as the dispensary, and and you know here soon, um, you know with retail ID that will be provided via via QR code to to customers, um, you'll be able to see the individual packages testing related all the way back to you know the. The beginning of the the life cycle of that plant. So um, when when they say seed to sale, they really mean you know from from the creation of that plant all the way to you know it, it's it's product being held in the hand by the customer. Thank you for that, um, Dave. You've got a technical background. In light of what Kevin just told us, um, how can you provide a high level understanding in terms of uh, 
the importance of uh, traditional barcodes as well as RFID technology and how it can help um, along those stages. Yeah, so I mean, for those, uh, hopefully most people know, but a barcode in general, this is a 1D barcode. That's those lines you see down here. So in a traditional situation, I can take a barcode image or I can take a handheld, I can scan that, but I have to image that. I have to see that to know what it is. So let me talk about RFID, which is also embedded in one of these metric tags, which again is heavily used, 24 states, and I think Kentucky's the newest coming online. The point being is, is I could walk into a room of 500 plants, seven different strains, take an RFID scanner and scan that entire thing. I wouldn't have to touch each plant. I wouldn't have to scan each one. Go forward. How does it, that can be detrimental when I start to go to package tags, when I've got these laying around on tables. I want to just hit this barcode so that I can adjust this package, not the five around me or 10. So really I look at the technologies as like a one-two punch, right? When I'm looking for mass reads, I'm looking to find something RFID. If I'm trying to talk specifically to a specific or update a specific record, barcode. So, I mean, I think that's how I see it most effective. I mean, most people are familiar with barcode codes on, on every product we know, right? But RFID is coming in quickly with traditional retailers like Walmart, Lululemon, and I know we're going to talk about that. Look, this technology just allows, for example, the ability with RF that I could just, like I said, I could hit a room of 500 plants where it might take me five minutes with a scanner or less, but it would take me hours to do each plant. And then I'm commingling, I'm, I'm causing contamination. That's the highest level. I would say, look, the technologies are not independent. I see barcode, RF, and human readable as a one, two, three punch. If the barcode's messed up, I can get the human readable. If if the RFID is damaged anyway, chip got cracked in, in and something happened, I still know what it is. So I don't think they're separate. I think they're one, if that helps. It does. And, and you you just referenced uh, Walmart, Lululemon, uh, um, you know, and I talked about Nordstrom and, you know, even Chipotle, um, you know, from a restaurant perspective are using, you know, both barcode and RF technology. I've heard people in the cannabis industry tell me, you know, like uh, I'm walking through MJ Biz and, uh, you know, trying to talk to them about RF technology. And they tell me Walmart and those guys couldn't figure it out. How do you expect us? So, you know, Dave, can you give them a high level, um, brief high level in terms of how those organizations are leveraging the technology and why? Yeah, I'll start. So I sold Walmart their first systems in 2005 when I was at uh, Matrix. So Matrix, basically, uh, the Walmart initiative was case level, not item level. They wanted to know the cases that came in the back of a store. If I know what came in, then I know what's in the back stock. If I take that and empty it out on the, on the sales floor, the product inside, the box comes back to a box crusher. In essence, I read the cycle. For them, it un they indicated back in the day, and this is years ago, that it was an $8 billion savings. So you think, well, how can that be? Well, for the reality of it is if I'm trying to buy a product and it's in the back stock room, I can't go back there and get it. They wanted to know that it's out. So by doing that, you're getting better visibility. So the Walmarts of the world have realized now they're starting to do item level. The one thing about RF that people have to understand is, look, certain things are limitations. This is just a basic foil bag. I'd have to put a flag tag, which is that tag that's hanging off there with that antenna. Why? I put that RFID tag directly on this foil bag, which is heavily used in Canada cannabis because of freshness. There's a lot of flower products, things of that nature that fit well into these. And they're very nice from a graphical print standpoint. They're really nice, but they're not super friendly for what we're trying to do. So I guess what I'm saying is Walmart and traditional retailers, Lululemon, you're talking about clothing. I can read through that very well. I can read through the, the cottons, the, the polyesters, you name it. Where, where RF will have limits is like metals. It's not porous. I can't get through it. So I don't know if that helps you, but that's kind of where I see these traditional retailers labor's getting very tight the cannabis industry just to give you an idea cannabis industry they don't it's tough to find the people so back to the walmarts walmart is a very tightly run, very, I call them a supply chain, not a retailer. They're the best supply chain in the world because they know how to cut every little piece in it to make it super profitable. That includes labor. They know that if I can know where product is, or I could even run robotics through my aisles in the middle of the night when we're sleeping and, and reconstitute what I have, what I don't have, they're going to basically sell more product. So I think the cannabis industry, I think does sometimes think of itself as an, as a um, pioneer, they're not the pioneer. I think they're a fast follower 
And I think there's a lot of need there, but I think that's where the traditional retailers have really set the bar high. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, we, and a oh, we did ahead. have a question come in that kind of relates to that. Somebody asked what, what ROI, you know, I, myself and my customers are seeing, you know, being in, with traceability beyond just the compliance piece. Um, and I think that's a, I think that's the best question involved in this. Right. And, and I'll, I'll kind of look at it from, from both standpoints, you know, from, production standpoint, cultivation and manufacturing, um, you know, the ability to not lose product to maintain, you know, not just operationally, not just looking at the benefits that that are there with, you know, kind of what I was looking at for, you know, seed projects and things like that, but, um, you know, not losing product, not, mis not pushing it into a space where you just don't see it for three months and then all of a sudden it's not, you know, I mean, these warehouses are enormous, right? That's one piece of it, but the the ability to um, inventory a space like that, you know, look, you're gonna you're gonna look at a room that has maybe ten different strains in it, and you're gonna be able to differentiate just by looking at it when you're familiar with it. Your ten different strains, right? But each of those strains, depending on the size of that room, might have five hundred plants per strain, right? You, you know, and and then talk about trying to go in and hand count those plants and pretend like you're going to be accurate as a human being or what, what the labor looks like to, to do that. Right. Um, you know, I, I once literally inventoried an entire facility in under, I want to say it was like under 25 minutes with over 16,000 plants. In it. I mean, you're going to have, if you're trying to inventory by hand 16,000 plants, you're talking about an army of people and it's going to take all that, um, you know, and then looking at it from more of the retail's perspective, right? Um, you're able to do your weekly inventory. Um, you know, you're able to do your compliance inventory. You're able to do, um, you know, keep, keep your reordering points on place, right? By understanding what your inventory levels are. Um, a client of our mine recently did a, a, an analysis on kind of what their inventory processes looked like before using technology that would kind of do this and after. And, you know, they have five stores. One of the stores, one of the stores is a pretty high volume store, dropped down their inventory costs per month, uh, you know, in, just looking at the labor side of it from about $2,000, $2,500 to sub three hundred dollars uh, in, in labor, so I mean that in and of its own is yeah. an insane savings. Yeah, see, see, Kevin's comment kind of stole away my next question, so I'm going to adapt it. You know, we've got an overachiever on this call here, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're talking about you know the 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 hard cost and revenue savings um, with the cost of uh, the RFID tags. Uh, you know, that, like. Years ago, that was a definite obstacle. Um, it was more expensive. So let's talk about it from a, a labor efficiency side, because, uh, you know, I spoke with a uh, dispensary owner in uh, Southern California. He was telling me, you know, like the people hated doing uh, inventory and things like that. And uh, when he showed them, you know, with the RF uh, reader, how fast they could inventory that back room. Everybody just jumped up cheering. Um, you know, so so from a labor efficiency, because I've always heard that the cannabis industry had overhired early on, um, you know, just overhired a multitude of people. You're the closest one to that, Kevin. How do you see um, from an operational efficiency standpoint of this technology making your customers much more efficient and how they can either control labor or repurpose labor to do, you know, less, let's call it mundane things, you know, like just scanning for inventory. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's been a game changer in, you know, look, you have, you have for the most part, an initial push for hiring people in states as cannabis becomes either legal or transitions from medical to recreational. You have people that are looking for gigs um, that, you know, may not be your best employees. Right. Um, but if you give someone the ability to, you know, perform a task and, and take the mundane or the um, really, truly ridiculously monotonous out of the equation, 
and give them a tool to effectively really assist uh, you, you know the company and, and explain to them why it, it, it's so much more helpful to to use this type of technology. Um, you end up empowering that employee. Um, you, you remove the redundancy uh, and you kind of push um, your employees to really want to be part of the processes that you're putting into place. Um, so over hiring, uh, I have seen facilities triple and quadruple hire for what they needed, um, you know, because they needed to get going, get off the ground. And they weren't letting anyone go as much as people were letting themselves go by not wanting to do the work. Right. Um, you know, and and as as this type of technology has kind of advanced and really become a part of the the you know ecosphere, I think it has enabled companies that were finding a harder time, you know, pulling those employees into a facility to do this type of work. It's it's enabled them to empower the people that they have to you know really get the job done. No, I've often said that um, you know early on I recognized that a uh, a lot of, especially on, on the dispensary side, a lot of those guys were much more customer service and customer centric focused than uh, I've seen in traditional retail. Dave, how have you seen uh, some of these operational efficiencies in, in, in your business dwellings? How, you know, are you seeing the same thing as Kevin? Yeah, I'd say a couple things I'll throw in there. One thing you have to keep in mind is is back to the ROI side of things. The ROI is also the fact you're being judged by a state auditor, right? That auditor's coming in to check your plants. They better be right. So beyond just I'm saving labor and so forth, I better have my counts accurate with the state of, in Kevin's case, Missouri. Because if not, I could have a hefty fine or worse, right? So that's one piece that's different from traditional retail. I've got a cop, if you want to call it that, showing at my doorstep, which is going to have a tool that's from metrics for example, because um, I sold them their handhelds to, to basically <laughs> scan these things. So that's one aspect. The other side of it is, look, I think the reality of it is um, this industry back to over having too many people. Every state starts out at a price point here, and then over time it, it erodes. And why? Because more and more, more it's supply and demand, more demand. Now all of a sudden it becomes more important. So I think the industry, if we've seen it, a lot of these folks in cannabis aren't making huge amounts of money. If In fact, some of the larger players are losing money. And the reason people think, well, they can't be, they're selling a lot. There's a lot of overhead. What's happening is now they're looking for efficiency and accuracy. So they're going to pull back and say, what do we have to do to basically go from 30 people in a dispensary to 15? Well, you better have systems, you better have tools, you better have functionality that can make the, take the place of those 15. And again, Kevin's point's well taken. Maybe seven of those weren't doing anything anyhow. But my point being is the industry is kind of right-sizing, as I like to call it. I think it's getting mature or more mature. Um, and then people have to understand each and every state's its own country. So the rules in Illinois require you to do an audit daily. Every day I have to do my entire dispensary. Holy crap. In other states, it might be monthly. Other states might be weekly. So you know what I'm saying? So I think it's kind of a uh, based on the unique requirements that they're under. I don't know if that answers it for you, but... No, it does. It does. Mike, I know we're at uh, 1230 um, and I see we do have one question. Do we have time for one more panel yep. question or do you want to just jump? No, you no, you can definitely ask another question. OK, so so this will be the last one. And uh, depending upon who's in the audience, it could be the most explosive. So love them or hate them. And believe me, there are folks on both sides. Metric has the lion's share of uh, states with uh, 25 government contracts now that they've added uh, Kentucky. What are some ways growers can leverage the RF tags they're required to purchase? How can those tags be leveraged to increase operational efficiency beyond, you know, just to grow? So I'll shoot it to, I'll let whichever one of you want to, wants to take that. Kevin, you want to start and I'll finish? Yeah, you know, sure. So uh, I, I think that one of the things that Metric is bringing out shortly is going to really aid in that, right? It's, it's I believe they're calling it retail ID. They're using a uh, the ability for uh, a produ production facility to create a QR code um, that will hold the all the information from that particular product. You know, both the historical testing from from the plant itself that was you know, the compliance testing that was passing with the state, you know, making it legal to sale, um, but then also kind of genetic testing and, and, and information that kind of the, the, the production facility will want to provide to the end user 
And I think that is going to be huge value, um, you know, for people because not all people are going to do it. It's not, you know, the only state right now that that's required in is Maryland. And that's where the development for it came from. Uh, but as different production facilities start to use this, their products are going to be sought after before others because people want to know, you know, as you have a mature market, you have mature consumers, people who care more about, you know, instead of looking at THC content and saying, oh, this is going to give me the most high for my buck. Now they're looking for, you know, terpene content and, you know, um, you know, different, different effects that those, those terps are going to, are going to provide. So I think, I think that QR and, and the advancement there is going to be the biggest, the biggest uh, push probably. For well, Kevin is the gift that keeps on giving. If we have more time, I would love to get into uh, terpenes and terpene profiles. <laughs> um, some states have, some states are aware, a lot of states aren't. Uh, um, so, you know, at this point, you know, I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Michael. I believe we've got at least one or two questions. Um to answer. Yeah, absolutely. So this question's for everyone on the panel. Uh, where it's legal, it seems like there are dispensaries on every corner. How are you helping your customers and how are your customers distinguishing themselves from other retailers? And are customers' technologies savvy enough for the traditional loyalty programs? That's Ooh. a softball for you, Kevin. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, there's a lot going on there, right? Uh, we we do custom website development for for dispensaries on a on a, a scale that kind of we take specific customers and work through kind of enhancing their SEO, uh, you know, traction. Um, that seems to really kind of assist our our clients and standing out amongst the crowd. You're not wrong. Um, there are there are certain platforms that are out there that are cookie cutter and look the exact same. So it does not matter if if you're this dispenser, you're this dispenser, you're going to have the exact same e-commerce, um, you know, but I think the, the other, the other thing that really has assisted in people standing up from the crowd is, is being inventive and in, in how they're using some of these things. We have a, a client I spoke to this morning. They have a, they have a, um, a, a like a box truck that has, uh, you know, digital signage on the side of them. Right. And they're they're driving around in that college town and, and advertising and doing their thing. But recently, they just picked up uh, QR codes that are now sticking on the bottom of those spaces because people got so used to QR codes during COVID that now they see a QR code and they're just going to pop out their camera. And where does that bring them? Brings them to their website and, and the online ordering so that they can literally make their order, pick up at the dispensary. Convenience is is you know kind of what. I think is going to continue to drive that, that loyalty. Um, and, and for the second part of that question, um, you know, look, large parts of the loyalty uh, piece out there are still intact. As long as you're going with the right companies, most places will shy away from cannabis. Um, right now, there are a few, a uh, few out there that will, will still support um, loyalty, you know, kind of work there. Um, but you have to kind of, you have to kind of piece it out and, and try and determine where, where it's at. The customers are savvy, um, but it does take a little bit of time for the, the uh, shiny new thing to wear off and for people to start looking at uh, this is a product as opposed to just buying whatever they can get their hands on. Yeah, one other thing I'll throw in there, Dwayne, is to, to throw into Kevin is, look, as far as AIDC, right, as far as technology, look, the biggest thing is you've got to have accurate inventory. If I show up to pick up a product, it better be in stock. They also have minimums, right? When you hit a certain minimum, it falls off the website because they can't, they don't want me driving across town, showing up, and my favorite whatever isn't there. So, I mean, where the technology that we're talking about fits in is, is the more you can cycle count, the more you have a better accurate inventory count, the better is your customer fulfillment's going to be there, right? You don't want me being upset because there is options. Just to throw that out there. No, yeah. and, and and you know, from from my perspective, um, you know, looking at that question, you know, I would caution people because um, you know I realize there are certain areas where it does appear, you know, like there are dispensaries on every corner. There are vans selling, you know, uh, THC or CBD lollipops and things like that. Be careful, you know. Just because you see it there doesn't mean it's licensed and, and it's legal. Um, so, you know, be careful with that. And, you know, in terms of how 
we Blue Star help our customers. What we do is um, we've, you know, uh, we've produced, you know, a couple of what we call seed to sale tech guys that we've uh, distributed and dispersed to our resellers that uh, exhibit at MJ BizCon, which is the largest cannabis show, if anyone's unaware. And, you know, within that, what we try to do is open up our product portfolio and show the products um, that are, you know, tried and true and tested. Um, and, you know, it's it's more of an investment. Um, you're not necessarily looking for the cheapest thing out there, um, but for quality. And so, you know, again, you know, we look at it from being a trusted consultant to our resellers um, in terms of digital signage, point of sale, um, RFID barcode scanning and everything in between, you know, um, I'm getting, you know, questions about, um, cannabis dispensing vending machines and self, um, you know, check-in kiosk and things like that. So if anybody has any questions, please reach out. I can send you that seed to sell tech guide and at least, you know, uh, get the process going. Great. And this question was directed toward David, uh, and it's about employee onboarding. How much training is typically required? It depends on the application. So we at Outlaw, we've created our systems as a SaaS model. So we really don't sell hardware. So we have handhelds and touchscreens, so a handheld. To get a dispensary up, we've set it up to where we can actually do web training, right? Uh, COVID forced us all to understand we can't knock on doors as easily. We can't go in facilities as easily. So um, you've got to make it very easy, very understandable. Look, iPhone set the standard. If you think of how easy it is that someone from eight years old to 80 year old can use that device. If you don't think in those terms and create tools that act similarly and are very intuitive to the person using it, this industry also has a tremendous turnover. Um, some of it's good where the, the people are leaving for better positions within the industry. Others, to Dwayne's point earlier, was they're just getting the hell out because it is a tough industry. It's a lot of work. Um, so I think the, the, the answer is short quickly is you got to make it very easily, get them trained. If you can't train them in 10 to 15 minutes, you got a problem. Great. And then this question too is just uh, from your perspective, what technologies are most popular to print tags for cannabis? Things like direct thermal, thermal transfer, and then how about for flag tags? So I think real quick, I'll hit it because timing. So a couple things on that one. Um, first, Metric's going to print these tags. You're going to buy these tags pre-printed, pre-encoded. So you're going to get it from Metric like this. You're not running through a printer you're associating. So these sort of tags, you're not going to play in this side of it. When you get down to the flag tag, your your direct thermal is probably going to be the, the easiest way to go. I mean, you're taking an existing like, price label and just printing over top, at least in a process that we've set up. Um, but a lot of the printing is done upstream. So there's less opportunity for printing. It's more going to be for the technology to read it. And then beyond supply chain management, do you see industry moving to RFID tags with some of the temperature and moisture RH sensors? The, you know, I think that they'll utilize the 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 technology to associate those sensors, um, you know, to the RFID tags for, with, that are being used with the seed to sale tracking. So, for instance, if you have um, at a client once, uh, they they always had a specific section of the room turning out, having issues, you know, producing seeds, trying to understand what was going on. And they were able to use the uh, the sensors. Um, they they use GrowLink for for kind of their their whole ecosystem and, and crop sharing in the, in their facility. And by using specific sensor data and understanding where in the room those sensors were, and then also understanding um, you know the tags that were being affected and showing these results in the back end, they were able to trace back and determine you know look they had this random diode and this one light that was popping on at like midnight um, and really messing up the the light dark cycle for this section of a room um, and stressing them out and causing causing them to uh, you know basically produce seeds. Um, so I, I do see that that will continue to grow in unison and, and companies like GrowLink are starting to pair up with other ERP solutions that will kind of help facilitate um, you know this information talking to this information. But I don't necessarily see other than having, you know, a, a QR codes on specific, you know, sensors or whatnot to understand where they're in the room, how they would put an RFID tag or what the viability would be for having that just based on the number of, of sensors that you have in a room. 
Yeah, I, I think Kevin's spot on. I think QR codes are going to add a whole nother uh, piece to this as, uh, you know, one, as more states uh, adopt and, you know, the consumers, you know, start to request more where you can just um, pop a QR code on there. And now you can get information about, you know, where the product was grown, how it was grown, um, terpene profiles um, that, uh, you know, Kevin talked about. I think you know, um, the RF technology is, uh, you know, just as Dave said, it's a piece of um, the puzzle. And so, you know, it's how you leverage all of these technologies together. That's going to, you know, complete the solution. Um, you, you know, anybody who listens to this and believes that, hey, I can put some RFID, you know, tags on everything in there and my life's just going to be so much easier not necessarily the case. Um, it's a piece of a solution that's, um, you know, targeted for a specific purpose. And it's how you leverage that with everything else that makes it into a total, you know, in, in my opinion, a total value add solution. Great. And I just wanted to note to the audience here, I do have the uh, contact us slide up for our three uh, panelists today. Again, thank you guys for your insights today. And before we go, just uh, briefly from each one of you, just wanted to get your thoughts on what you see as the future of the seed to sale uh, technologies, uh, what your perspective is the future is going to be. And we'll start with you, Kevin. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Pre appreciate that. Um, I think the future for this technology is probably going to be um, all the states that are legal right now are basically the guinea pig for the federal government. And, and I, I think whoever ends up proving that they're doing it best or whatever group ends up proving what they're doing it best is going to probably be the first to open up interstate commerce using this technology. And then I think once that happens and it happens successfully, um, you know, I, I think the floodgates will be open and the federal government will have to follow. And I, I do think that a high probability that the, um, you know, the, the, the different native, native tribes um, and their, their processes moving forward might end up being the exemplary role. I mean, there are some places in the states where, where, you know, it, it's, it's subpar and, and they're really doing some interesting or, or maybe not productive things. But I think that there are some states where uh, some of the tribal associations are, are pushing this forward in a way that will be hugely beneficial to uh, to to larger um, commerce, you know, federally. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in next and then we'll let Dwayne finish. But look, I think the reality we have to understand is this is not a U.S. only situation. Europe is actively making moves from Germany, Portugal, uh, Israel and, and, the, and so forth, Thailand. I mean, I could go on and on. My point being is this is not going to be localized to our country, right? Canada is legalized across their entire, con their entire country. So I think what's happening here is also, to, to Kevin's point, kind of a bellwether. If we can figure out a good way to track and trace this, do this seed to sale, I think metric is set a bench marked it's very unique i think they've set up something where i as an overseer a state auditor can see what's being produced what's destroyed i can look at everything holistically that's not normal right that doesn't exist in traditional retail i have no purview to what walmart ordered what's shipping or what they're selling so it does change the model but i do think the future is going to be more of this kind of model seed to sale could be you know item to to sale i mean it doesn't limit itself to cannabis but cannabis in and of itself as a nutshell is a global phenomenon. It is moving into other countries and it's not going to, I don't think it's going to backstep one bit and Kevin's spot on with interstate commerce, but then beyond interstate commerce is import export. So those are some things for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, me, you know, when people ask me, I, I believe that uh, cannabis will uh, long-term look very similar to uh, the beer industry. I think, um, you know, like I'd be surprised if the DEA doesn't um, reclassify cannabis um, in the schedule this year, um, I'd be very surprised. And and that's going to open up a whole lot of things in terms of uh, eliminating or, you know, substantially reducing, you know, the impact of 280E from the IRS on the cannabis industry. I think ultimately you're going to get some big players who's going to come in and let's say there'll be, you know, like the Miller, Budweiser, Coors, you know, of the industry. But I think that there is going to be more than enough room for, um, let's call them, uh, 
you know, like the micro brews, um, you know, where, you know, you've got micro growers who, you know, they specialize, um, you know, in, in, in certain strains and things like that. I really think, um, you know, that's going to take off. And, uh, you know, to both of their points, you know, once you can do interstate um, commerce, then, you know, you know, if if you like a strain that's grown in Southern California, but you live in Colorado, you'll be able to get that. Um, I would imagine, you know, like pr during prohibition and the legalization of alcohol, they uh, encountered some of this. Uh, unfortunately, none of us, uh, with the exception of maybe Dave, was around during that time. Had to take a poke at you. You can but, try. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, like uh, not only how the industry changes, but how, you know, we and our manufacturer partners uh, change and adapt to it um, to be able to offer, you know, viable solutions to them. Great. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Kevin, for your time and insights today. It's greatly appreciated. Appreciate hey, thank it. you to everybody who uh, joined in to listen to us three guys, uh, you know. Yammer. Chat it up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yep. And uh, if you have any questions about AIM North America, you can always contact us to learn more about our adv advocacy community, education, and standards uh, development. So, so that, thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Hey, thank you. Thanks.